The following is an excerpt from Helen Vendler's article, The Later Poetry, taken from the Cambridge University Companion to William Butler Yeats Poetry, published in 2006. Although Yeats had privately published his stirring Easter 1916 before the 1917 publication of The Wild Swans at Cool, he held it back until the furor of the event had died down. It appeared, together with other poems about the Rising and its dramatist Personae, in the 1921 volume, companioned by the second famous poem of the volume, apocalyptically entitled The Second Coming which was an altogether more archetypal poem about the turn of history toward violence. In these poems, we can see three characteristic modes of late Yeats, that is, the historic, the archetypal, and the personal. Together with his other late poems, they raise questions as to whether Yeats is the last romantic as he said himself, or the first modernist. Some critics have been unwilling to grant him the modernist label because he wrote within traditional genres and verse forms. Others see that the originality and even blasphemy in his employment of those genres and those forms removes him from romantic and Victorian modes of writing and makes him rather the first of the iconoclastic modernists writing in English. If Yeats' first mode is historical, the second, as I have said, aspires to the archetypal and even the apocalyptic. All particular historical reference is suppressed as Yeats opens the second coming, with the impersonal stance of an epic viewer from above of the entire earth. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. This becomes the octave of a failed impersonal blank verse sonnet. The poem cannot continue in the impersonal mode, it cannot write its own sestet. Therefore, Yeats re-begins the poem in line 9 as a sonnet in the first person, which then, as one man's lyric perspective, can find its sestet. Yeats could not have completed the poem without the mutation of the voice of the cosmic sage to the voice of the located I. The apocalyptic declaration of the poem, that the 2,000 years of Christian hegemony are ending, and that a new sphinx-like force that will govern the next 2,000 years is slouching towards Bethlehem to be born, is nonetheless not made entirely, entirely in declarative form. I know that is followed by and what, rough beast. The non-parallel syntax shows that the poet's knowledge is limited. He is convinced that a new force is imminent for which the cosmic cradle has been set rocking. Yet what sort of beast it will be is as yet undetermined. Unlike the canonical apocalypse, the modernist apocalyptic utterance is of not certain is not certain of its visions. The three modes that I have identified as historical, apocalyptic, and intimate continue to be of use to Yeats in his next volume, The Tower, published in 1928 but they are joined there by a fourth mode, which I will call the comprehensive one, a mode that attempts to survey an entire life from beginning to end and say something that is true of the whole rather than of a single episode or single mood. Among schoolchildren published in the Tower, scrutinises and debates Yeats' life choices, the most comprehensive of all Yeats' late poems, among schoolchildren, also rises to an odal address. After a deliberately mundane and autobiographical beginning in which Yeats, the senator, 
who bitterly sees himself at 60 as a scarecrow and a smiling public man, visits children in kindergarten and is shown round by the nun in charge. His mind wanders to what Maud Gone might have looked like as a child of their age. But then, cruelly, his imagination shows her to him as she is now at 60. Hollow of cheek. This despairing diptych of Maud, young, and old, is succeeded by a second diptych of the poet himself, young and old. We see a male child as a shape upon his mother's lap, and then encounter him at a poet's age, with sixty or more winters on its head, as his mother, own mother, judges that, given what her son has become at sixty, she should not have been born and raised him. The learning on which the children in the schoolroom are embarking is thought by humanists to lead to the highest spiritual efforts. And yet when Yeats thinks of those who have carried it farthest, Plato the philosopher of the invisible ideal, Aristotle the philosopher of the solid real, and Pythagoras the philosopher of the aesthetic, he reduces them to physical scarecrows, just like himself. The success of the mind does not compensate for the failure of the body. As a backdrop to the individual scarecrows that he and Maud Gone have become, we can see sorry, we can see Stretch, the scarecrow freeze of all past thinkers and creators. It is at this low point that the poem resorts to the Odal address calling out to all the idols created and worshipped by human beings. The lover idolises the object of his passion. The nun idolises in her piety the divinity symbolised by the statues before which she prays. The mother, in affection, idolises her child. And yet these objects of devotion, one and all, end up breaking the hearts of the worshippers. Yeats calls out bitterly to our idealised objects and breaks off, unable to continue his address to them, when he states, O presences, that passion, piety or affection knows, and that all heavenly glory symbolise, O self-born mockers of man's enterprise. The marring of the erotic body by Christian asceticism, the marring of the emotions by the despair of the unrequited love of poet, the marring of the eyes of the philosophers by their midnight study, seem to be the bitter results in old age of piety, passion and learning. At this lowest point the poem is rescued, at the last possible moment by a massive reconceiving of life. Hitherto, life has been indexed by its two determining points, its promising inception and its betrayed close. Now, with a mighty effort, Yeats begins to think of life in two new ways. He perceives it, first, as an ongoing organic process that continues, always, even in age, to bear the blossoms of perpetually efflorescing inner energy. When he states, O chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? Through the image of the sturdy blossomer, inseparable into its parts, is a consoling one. The blossoming of the tree is involuntary. It's if it's seasonal. In these respects, Yeats knows it differs from human creativity. In a final burst of inspiration, Yeats replaces the image of the chestnut tree with another, that of the self-choreographing dancer, who, with the continual brightening glance of creative invention, spontaneously conceives and executes to the music imposed by fate, a self-born 
self-identifying pattern. This is not an external image. It is an internal image that the self makes of the self. The dancing dancer represents living as a continually invented creative act extended over time. One is not then, in terms of identity, either the child one was or the scarecrow one is. One's identity is the linear shape self-choreographed throughout life, a shape never ceasing to evolve and continuous from childhood right through to death. A comparably comprehensive and philosophical poem on the compensation of loss by creativity. In modernist fashion, Yeats found a way to be more than his less than human enamelled singing bird or blossoming chestnut tree. The fully human portrait of the dancer inventing a dance to the music of time reconceives life as a fluid motion, a voluntary cooperation with and interpretation of one's fated location in historical time and space.